clicking on this video if you are new to my channel welcome if you're a second time third time fourth time watcher welcome back thank you so much for tuning in now in today's video I am going to share with you uh, from personal experience the process I went through in order to buy my house um, so this video is for a person that's looking to purchase their first house and are probably wondering you know what, what exactly is involved in buying a house. Buying a house is a huge process. There are quite a few people involved. It can be a bit scary from the offset. You'll see that it's not as big and scary as you might have initially thought. Use this video as a stepping stone, you know, go ahead and do your own research. Obviously you could have read all of this online, but you know, it's sometimes it's good to talk. Without further ado, let's get into the tips. And also I have written them down. So if I'm looking down, that's, that's what that is. It's a whole lot. And I want to remember everything so that you are well advised on what to expect. So here we go. The first thing to bear in mind, obviously, is can you afford this house? That's the first place you need to start. Do you have the finances in place in order to be able to purchase this property? And you know, this kind of goes without saying. So where do you start? Most property websites, um, I would suggest that, you know, just to get yourself familiar, pop on Rightmove or pop on Zoopla, you know, any one of these property websites, um, have a look at some of the houses that you like. You will have a section at the bottom. If you look on the property in the information section, it will actually have a mortgage calculator at the bottom. So what that does is it allows you to see um, how much a monthly repayment would be. You put in your different variables, you know, if you want a 25 year mortgage, what the monthly repayment will be, that kind of thing. So um, that's your first step and see if you can afford those monthly payments. The second step of that process obviously is that you need your deposit. I think at the moment it's 10%. Uh, so yes, the banks are going to want you to have 10% of the total property cost up front so that you can use that as a deposit. So if you haven't got that 10% up front um, and it's something that you can't raise within the next, you know, the foreseeable future, yeah, I'd probably suggest that you get a little bit creative. And even before I go into this, I believe that now there are lots of government schemes that allows you to purchase properties perhaps without a deposit or um, maybe at the moment banks are lowering their deposits so yeah it's important to see what's going on in, in the property and the financial game at the moment uh, the banking game because these things change you know quite regularly so maybe at the moment and different banks will perhaps have different uh, deposit uh, requirements so you know check that out uh, th like i said this is just a benchmark for you to see where to start your research right now, if you're trying to raise that 10% um, and you haven't got it immediately, I would suggest maybe approaching your family, you know, get creative. I used to work for a, a long time in the corporate world and I was blessed enough, fortunate enough to be able to travel to China quite a bit. And I was surprised to see in China that most people do not have mortgages. Mortgages is a very alien concept in China and that's because people band together, they lend each other the money. You know so think out of the box a little bit if you're struggling to raise your deposit ask friends and families if you're in a big family the better ask a few people to just you know lend you a couple of thousands here and there and then you'll get your deposit together now I know that buying a house and so you know rightly it should be where you live is essential to who you are as a person and especially if you have family as well so um, yes definitely be excited about this stage of the process but also think as well that this essentially should be an investment opportunity for the future. It's good to live somewhere that's comfortable and looks amazing and somewhere you can stunt and all these things. But uh, don't forget that investing in property is an opportunity for you to reap a lot of benefits if you invest wisely later on. Um, so I'm going to go through a few processes in terms of how to kind of spotlight the best properties that are going to be a good investment for the future. I always suggest buying houses that you can add value to. Now there are ways that you can add value to a property. Some of them are a huge undertaking. We're talking about, you know, the adding extensions around the back or converting lofts. Um, I'm not necessarily suggesting any of that. If you're looking for uh, spaces that could be made open plan, that's quite contemporary for people to have open plan living, eating and dining. You're looking for uh, properties that don't have double glazing. If they're not the best insulated. Uh, places where they haven't capitalized on the garden area so you can spruce up the garden. Anything that you can modernize always adds value. Properties with old boilers, you can add value by updating the boiler, updating the electrical system. Houses with original flooring, original chimneys, anywhere that has big spaces 
areas that you can split into. Adding an extra bedroom is always going to add more value. You can look out for these things during viewing or you can ask before you put the bid in. You can ask the estate agent look out for. You can uh, put these things down as, you know, some requirements towards your estate agent and they'll feed that back to the buyer. What's the age of the boiler? When was the last electrical update? If you're selling your house, you'll have these things prepared anyway. So don't think that you're doing the most if you're asking the estate agents to ask the buyer to provide this information because they usually have it. If the thought of renovation scares you, there are other ways that you can invest in a property that will give you a, a good amount of return on your investment. Look at areas where um, you know there's lots of re regeneration going on, improved transport links. Um, check out the area first if there's going to be a new school built. These are ways that you can buy a property and then in the future it could turn out to be a real gold mine for you. And another tip is to look at estate agent websites that have the historical data. So if you pop onto Rightmove for example, you put that property in, it will tell you the last time it was sold, how much it was sold for or properties in that area generally how much they're being sold for. So you can get a good incremental upward trend then that's a good investment option. Another thing to bear in mind as a buyer are chains. Um, so just to explain what a chain is, if you're looking at a property, oftentimes you'll see in the description that it's chain free. A chain is, for example, if you wanted to purchase my home, I wanted to buy another home. So that's why I'm selling my home. Now you as a buyer, you might be affected if I decide, um, you know, I change my mind, the house that I want to buy, something's happened there and I'm going to have to pull out of this purchase. So that's, that's what happens when you're in a chain. This is why it's a better option for you to purchase properties that are not involved in a chain. I wouldn't worry too much because most people are in chains, but if you see a property that's chain free, I would, uh, consider that as a plus point. If you are electing to buy a property that's within a shared, shared ownership scheme, I suggest that you do your research, see whether you're able to sell in the future, how reselling works, how much of the property you actually own. Do your research when it comes to shared ownership uh, properties. A couple of terms to be familiar with when you're looking at mortgages. First and foremost is the mortgage term. So when you're, if you're going through the process of buying a house, you have to be familiar with terms and all these other names. Okay, so the term is the length of the mortgage. So when you see on paperwork or if you're researching online term, it means the length of the mortgage. So on average, this is usually for, for a first time purchase, this is usually 25 years. So your terms vary depending on the amount of uh, your loan amount, how much money you're gonna borrow from the bank. You also need to be familiar with interest rates. Interest rates are usually going to be listed as anywhere between, you know, 3% up to 7%. These are usually the interest rates that you're referring to when you're buying a property. Now the interest rate refers to how much the interest is going to be based on the loan amount that you, you're taking out. So obviously the lower the interest rate, then the better it is because, you know, this is over a significant amount of years if it's your first purchase and you haven't got um, a significant deposit it's going to be quite a few a few hundred thousand pounds so the interest on that is going to be significant uh, so you need to pay attention to what the interest rate is likely to be and also in line with interest rates you need to be familiar with the mortgage type so there are two types of mortgages but these are the two that you need to pay attention to fixed rate and variable rate interests so your fixed rate interest, this is when you found a mortgage and the interest that you'll be paying back is fixed. So say it's 5.7% uh, or whatever, uh, the bank will say, okay, this will be the interest rate on the mortgage and it will be fixed for three years, five years, whatever. So the other option is to get a variable rate mortgage. This is to do with the rates the banks are charging at the moment. There's pros and cons for doing that, but again, this is a stepping stone to do your own research. I usually go for fix. I don't have time to be variabling <laughs> all over the place. I wanna know what I'm paying and that's that. Basically, sometimes the rates might dip lower. So obviously, if you've chosen a fix, it's fixed for a set number of years and you don't get to choose the number of years. The banks usually say, okay, it's this long. Um, if it's variable, you might find that there are times, because this is the thing with property and markets and finance, things are fluctuating. So there might be a, a stage, for example, if I've taken out a mortgage, the rate is 6.7. Interest at a certain, you know, a certain stage in the life of the mortgage 
might dip to 4% or something at that stage you're laughing whereas if for myself I usually elect fixed rates of mortgages I would be held into that agreement for the duration of the time I couldn't be capitalizing on the fact that the interest rates have dipped so that's one of the benefits of you going down the variable rate mortgage route for most people they take a fixed rate mortgage um, but yeah do your own research on that another term to get familiar with is the terms the payment terms you're looking at either repayment or interest only so with repayment you are paying off the whole thing so the interest rate and also the loan amount with interest only this I believe this tends to be a bit cheaper because all you're paying is the interest now you're probably thinking why would I opt to just pay the interest like I said it's potentially more affordable but also you would be surprised if you're buying a house it's a huge investment you you'd probably spend the first five years not doing a damn thing to that loan amount <laughs> all you're paying is interest anyway you know it cut it takes a long time a good number of years before you actually start to pay off that loan amount so like I said before the interest as you might think 4% isn't a lot 5% or whatever it is when you're looking at 5% on a huge number of as a huge sum of money it does really add up so sometimes it's a good option just to pay the interest initially and it keeps your costs a little bit uh, more manageable then you can jump in to start paying the loan amount because then it would be lower anyway because you paid quite a bit of the interest off another thing to look out for is the redemption fee now this uh, this is standard anyway if you're taking out a mortgage there will be what they call a redemption fee or an early repayment fee uh, initially when I bought my property I was like who cares about that but listen when it came to selling my house it came to buy another house that redemption fee which at the time was about four thousand pounds right <laughs> if you pay your mortgage off early this is what the redemption fee is your early repayment charge when you pay your mortgage off early or if you sold your property if you sold your property and buying a new one that's essentially paying your mortgage off early so there is a charge for doing that um, and this is standard it's not something you can essentially avoid uh, you can opt out of this process but as a first-time buyer I would definitely suggest you go down this route or if alternatively you have a, like a personal family connection or then you can go this alone but I would definitely suggest get a mortgage broker involved so what is a mortgage broker? A mortgage broker is basically the person that understands everything to do with mortgages. He's the, obviously he's the mortgage guy. <laughs> uh, so this is why I suggest that you get a mortgage broker on board because they're going to know everything about what's happening in the mortgage industries. They are the go between uh, between yourself as a buyer and the bank. So they will be uh, well versed on what the rates are. They're basically the rate people. So you give them your information and they'll be able to work out the best financial package for you because they have connections with all of the going rates. So this is why it's good to have a mortgage broker on your team. Now, where would you find a mortgage broker? Obviously you can go online, um, word of mouth. I'm always an advocate of word of mouth. Your estate agent is definitely able to recommend a good mortgage broker. And it's good to go with who the, the estate agent recommends because uh, they would only be recommended if they have a proven track record of being able to deliver. So what to expect from your mortgage broker, how the process works. Basically you will complete a form. It's just to kind of certify I'm working on your behalf, but also to attest to your financial status and um, you know whether you're able to afford this mortgage. So they'll put all of that together for you and apply to the banks on your behalf. Now with my first property purchase, my salary wasn't quite reaching the benchmark for the kind of property I wanted to buy. My mortgage broker, um, he drafted a letter for me. The letter was a, a kind of confirmation from my employers to say that, okay, this is her salary at the moment, but in the future, she does get regular bonuses and that will improve her baseline salary. So um, that's something to consider. If at the moment, the threshold in terms of your salary, it's not quite meeting the, um, the minimum, your your mortgage broker will perhaps say that as well they'll probably ask you're not quite there is there um do you have like a side income or um any way that you can bump up your salary a little bit so that's something to consider so once you've completed the form with the mortgage broker he'll send that off to the banks and then he'll come back to you with the rates that you're able to get based on your financial status 
these things need to be written down so you have a paper trail and also for your own um, recollection as well so when you do get those initial rates in pay very close attention because what they're going to relay is like I said before your term so um, I know for my second purchase my second property purchase um, I was playing around with the terms a little bit because I had a humongous deposit I didn't necessarily even need to take out a mortgage because I had bought a renovation property I did need um, you know an extra little bit of cash in order to renovate the property so I took out a smaller mortgage and the term on that was quite small this is where if you have a big deposit and um, you know you want to play around with the terms a little bit this is why I'm saying to pay attention because you might be going backwards and forwards playing around with the term sometimes if you extend the term then the interest rate changes a little bit so yes you know keep all these things as a record so you know where you are when you're toying around with the um, the terms and the interest rates and what you'll do is if it's a fixed rate mortgage that you're after this will be fixed for example for five years after that you're gonna have to alter that mortgage and this is usually done with the banks so for my first property after five years the rate had expired I had gone over my fixed term period so I needed to get another mortgage it's quite a simple process you just call your bank and say okay what are the deals at the moment and then your bank will tell you okay we have this 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 and then you choose another rate for the next few years or whatever you decide to do because mortgage brokers are quite busy people sometimes there might be a tiny mistake so definitely pay attention once you're at the stage where I've decided on this mortgage deal then once you're receiving the paperwork for that pay attention that the term is what you want the rate is what you agreed and um, whether it's fixed or variable all of that is agreed once you have confirmed on the mortgage that you want with your broker then he will kind of officially write to the undertakers <laughs> I always laugh at that word undertaker <laughs> they're basically the people that handle the big people in the banks that handle all the loans so this is when things get really serious you and your broker they're just kind of tentatively looking at stuff once you decide okay this is the mortgage I want your mortgage broker will then write to your bank on your behalf and say okay I want to apply for this mortgage for this uh, individual can you send me um, all the information I require at that point your information is now with the bank and they will say okay they will send you a message once they've received the application to say we have your mortgage application you can expect to hear back from us um, in the next couple of weeks or however long it's taking at that time this is the thing with banks and this is important if you're trying to buy a property quickly the banks depending on how busy they are at the time can take a few weeks to get back to you so if they're not very busy expect a response within two weeks if they're busy then expect a response within like a month or so because if you spot it for example the mortgage broker has written to the bank to say okay we're gonna go with this package can you send us back an agreement if you spotted some kind of discrepancy then the mortgage broker is gonna have to write back to the bank and then the amendments gonna have to be made and then the process starts again so if you're looking to purchase the property quite speedily make sure that you're very clear on these things and you're paying attention to all the small details because any kind of amendments they do add up especially when it comes to dealing with the bank so what to expect is once you've decided this is the mortgage your bank has also agreed okay we can give you this mortgage this is what's referred to as a mortgage in principle then you're essentially good to go in terms of buying the property once you've received that mortgage and principal offer from your bank it kind of sits there until you're now ready to go ahead with the purchase which I'll explain later once everything is sorted out then you will actually receive your mortgage so what your mortgage broker and yourself will be working on before that is just to get the mortgage in principle sorted out before you go ahead and start to exchange contracts so just to finalize mortgage broker you can expect to pay for a mortgage broker around 250 300 pounds and the last thing I wanted to mention on uh, a mortgage in principle I would suggest that you you start this process if you know you're gonna purchase a home this puts you in a very good buying position when you pair up with your estate agent and they're representing you to the seller they will say okay this person has a fairly premium position because they have a mortgage in principle and for myself for example 
I would be looking out for people in that position because that means I can sell quickly. <laughs> I want a quick sale. Okay, so the next set of people that you're gonna need to work with are solicitors. You're gonna need legal representation when you're purchasing a property. What solicitors do, they handle all the legal aspects of the property purchase. So they'll be the goal between, between your estate agent, councils, the buyer's solicitor, they will talk to the buyer's legal team. Every aspect of legal representation will be handled on your behalf by your solicitors. Your solicitors are representing you in a legal perspective. Where to find solicitor? Word of mouth. Always an advocate for word of mouth. If not, obviously hop online. But again, your estate agent will recommend a really good solicitor. So what to expect from your solicitor? A ton of paperwork. <laughs> A ton of paperwork this is not even an understatement keep all of your paperwork this is very serious stuff sign your paperwork quickly you know you want to get things moving as quickly as possible what I'd say to look out for when working with a solicitor a good solicitor is that they should be professional they should uh, have a good level of communication you should be able to communicate with them extremely speedily um, they should respond quickly to your emails um, they should be easily contactable so it shouldn't be taking a long time for you to hear from them and you should also be able to speak to them quite easily. I know for myself with Purple Bricks when I was purchasing my second property it was a nightmare. I was waiting to hear back from solicitors for days, for weeks, you know, and you don't want people like that representing you. Speed is going to be very important when you're trying to buy a property. You don't want to rush, there's a difference between rush and speed but you do want to get things moving along very quickly because buying a house can take a, a long time. So how much you can expect to pay for a good solicitor? Probably around £2,000, just under. So I think I paid £1,007. Um, and you will pay half up front and then half once the property has completely been purchased. Mm. So the next people that you're going to need on your team are surveyors. So what do surveyors do? They survey your property. So they're going to check um, any issues that relate to the structural viability of the property. They're looking for things like damp, subsidence, asbestos! <laughs> Inside joke. Asbestos, they're looking for anything that will jeopardize um, the purchase of the property, jeopardize your health and well-being, but anything that will um, reflect on the purchase price of the property. So you have to pay very close attention to survey results, um, and it's actually quite shocking, but you don't necessarily need to have a survey done. A survey is optional. Um, for some banks, actually, they do make it compulsory for you to have a survey done. Um, but for some banks, they're not fast. I definitely, definitely, a thousand percent recommend you get a survey done. So what to expect from the surveyor? The surveyor is going to go ahead and check the structural viability of the property. That will be arranged with the seller and you can expect a very thorough report at the end of his checking. <laughs> you can expect a very thorough report at the end of all his investigations. Now there are different types of surveys. <laughs> now I told you guys, buying a house is long. <laughs> There's a lot to expect. But what you want to purchase is a home buyer's report. Also in terms of finding your surveyor, because I wanted to buy my second property quite quickly, the location of the surveyor was very important to me. So I just went online, found uh, surveyors that were located in the area that I was buying the property in, and I just worked with them. I went for that option because your dealings with the surveyor won't be for an extended period. It will literally just be, they pop in, do the survey, give you the results, that's it. Whereas with your solicitors, literally every day you're going to be hearing from them. Your mortgage broker is an everyday thing. All these other people, it's quite daily, quite frequently. But for your surveyor, it's literally in and out. The only criteria that I worked according to was to ensure that they were Royal Chartered Surveyors Certified. They're registered with the Royal Institute of Surveyors. So that means that they're basically a governing body that oversees the work of the surveyor because, you know, buying a house is a pretty big deal. You don't want any and anybody coming up in you know, your police and then saying, mm -mm. you want their work to be carried out to a professional standard. Don't go for the cheapest. A quick word about surveyors. Their job is to kind of spot obvious defects. In my case, um, asbestos was found and there was an assumption made that if we found asbestos in one area, 
then it will affect the entirety, entirety of the property. I, because of my naivety in terms of not having done this before, wasn't aware if it's suggested that asbestos is in a property for example you need to find out where how extensively this has affected specific areas so how you do that is you go and you have a supplementary survey done because once i started work on my second property with the asbestos and i had the supplementary survey done it revealed that asbestos was in the kitchen roof i had to take down that whole entire roof so that was a cost that i hadn't foreseen so, you know, it's very important that you have the supplementary survey done so that if you have to renovate, you're able to budget and you're able to plan the financial implications of working on uh, renovating and fixing that property up. In terms of cost, you're looking to spend around £550 on a surveyor. And also another reason why it's important to pay attention to your survey results, <laughs> because it will be used as a tool for negotiation if the survey results do bring up some quite important issues then you can use those findings as a basis for which to negotiate in the future. Okay, so another factor to bear in mind when you're buying your first house is the negotiation and bidding aspect of property purchase. So I would say never to go for the asking price. And obviously you can't just say, oh, I want discount for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> there are ways to justify why you want to ask for a lower price. First is, if you, like I said before, if you hop onto a property website, such as Right Move, you can see what various uh, neighborhood properties have been sold for in the past. So you're able to have a good benchmark of what uh, the actual value of the property really should be. Because for me, when I was selling my property, we inflated the price, but you know, funny enough, the, the buyer was fine with paying it. So sellers always inflate their prices because they want to make the most profit. Another thing to look out for, and you can ask your estate agent this, is how long has the property been on the market for? If the property has been on the market for like an absolute eternity, then you are in a really strong position to put in a price that's lower than the asking price. Now, if you want to give some pretty strong reasons for lowering prices, once your survey results have come in, this is time for you to renegotiate again. So I know for me, when I was purchasing my second property, survey results came through and I saw asbestos. I was just like, oh my day. I freaked out and you know, I, I wanted money to be taken off because you're selling me an asbestos ridden house. Do you know how much money that's gonna take to, I didn't even really know what I was getting involved in, but I knew that I would have to, the price of the house has had to be lowered because I was going to have to remedy those defects. So pay attention to your survey results, any defects that are thrown up, then you can use that as a basis for which to negotiate in the future. So during my second property purchase, the shed outdoor, there's, there's some outbuildings, outbuildings were collapsing, uh, there wasn't a boiler, there wasn't a central heating system. Pay attention to all of these things um, because you can use those as very strong and concrete basis to negotiate the asking price later on down the line. Now your seller might not budge. You might bring to the table valid reasons for um, the price to be lowered and you start your negotiations. And you know, your seller might say, you know, I, I don't fancy lowering the price because they might feel like they're in a very strong position. Now this is where you have to get quite tactical. You have to think out of the box a little bit. And this is why I also suggest that if you are, if you are asking for prices to be lowered, that you, initially asks for a bigger amount to be taken off which gives you room to lower that amount later down the line if your seller is refusing to budge but don't go down widely this kind of goes without saying but definitely leave some room for you to be able to negotiate so you can appease the seller a little bit now if you think you're justified in asking for a reduction especially in my case where we found asbestos you can dig your heels in and just threaten to pull out like a whole entire diva just say, listen, hey, I'm not, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do this, right? You're not giving me what I want. I think I'm being fair in what I'm asking for. So at this stage, I'm just ready to, to back out of the whole thing. And all of these things are very delicate. You kind of have to um, know the position of your seller. You know, what kind of position they're in. If you will get a rough idea of how sturdily they're going to be digging their heels in on how much they want to sell this property throughout the whole buying process. So you can kind of use that to gauge how how much of a potential you have to dig your heels in and kind of throw a strop to say, listen, no, I'm not I'm not budging on my request for a lower a lower price. This is the only time when I would be an advocate for working with purple bricks because you're dealing with the seller directly. 
at that stage for myself personally I had built up a rapport with the person that was set because with purple bricks that you hardly deal with the estate agent you just deal with the actual person that's selling the home so I was dealing with them on a consistent basis so we had developed um, quite a rapport and this is why I would always recommend if you're dealing with a seller directly make sure you're pleasant make sure to always encourage good uh, working relationships encourage harmony between the two of you because you never know when you might need it in the future and definitely with negotiations this is when you will need a harmonious uh, foundation between the two of you another thing to bear in mind is that you will buying a home it takes a few months you would have you would have been going through this process for several weeks it can be tiring so here you are at the end of things threatening to throw a strop and not buy the house anymore your seller there is a very high possibility that your seller will you know they'll try to do they do want their money they do want a good investment but they don't want to lose you as a buyer so definitely be honest give them valid reasons and this is why it's important as well while you're communicating to definitely sound knowledgeable present yourself as a professional and somebody who is knowledgeable because seller don't know who they're talking to <laughs> and this is only in the event that you're dealing with the um seller personally if you're going through like your purple bricks and stuff um but yes another suggestion is to during your viewings bring an expert with you so it you know it's all fine and dandy to bring your mom and your friend and all these people but uh, definitely bring somebody that has some experience when it comes to properties with you because what will happen is they are able to spot things that you might not see as somebody who potentially doesn't have the best experience when it comes to properties so um, it's good to bring a plumber good to bring a builder so they can spot all of these things that might be a problem in the future I definitely suggest that you are very careful in who you elect to bring with you make sure these people are supportive make sure that they're visionaries especially if you're buying somewhere that needs full renovation because they might not see your vision and they might talk you out of a potentially lucrative and profitable venture. Another tip is to ask for supplementary information. Yes, you can as a buyer ask for further information, like I said before, even supplementary things. So for um, for my buyer, she asked for an electrical survey. I was like, where did, where did you even find this? <laughs> Contact your um, energy board, I think it is. They, they do them for free. So they look at how um, electronic rays are affecting the property. You can also ask for things to be fixed. My buyer asked for me to fix a few things in the property before she um, she was satisfied enough to be able to purchase it. Another thing to note is that during this whole process, nothing is confirmed. Nothing is confirmed. Everything is tentative. So this is what I touched on before in terms of the chain situation. You could essentially have gone through this whole entire process. You're, you have your mortgage, survey has been done, and then your buyer decides that they, you know what, they don't want to sell the house anymore. <laughs> and they are at total liberty to do that. None of this is binding until you have exchanged contracts. So this is the point where the house now belongs to you. Before that, the whole thing can fall apart. Try not to make any concrete decisions. Try not to go out and start buying, you know, 1,000 things, your big expensive bed. <laughs> don't make any big purchases unless you have definite confirmation now there are things that you can do beforehand so you can go ahead and be familiar with who the council is um, who is uh, providing the water um, you know all these different little things the energy you can put yourself in a position to know who are the utility um, suppliers and then once everything is signed over then all of that is ready to go. It's good to be knowledgeable of who those people are so you can just go ahead and say, listen, I now own this property. Can you just sign everything over for me? This is why you might see a house and you will see the term STC, which means um, sold subject to terms and conditions. Because what it means is they found a buyer, um, the house is going through the process of being sold, but if something happens, the whole thing can fall apart and the house goes back on the market. Buyers are still able to see that house. To remember, when you're selling a home, sometimes, for very personal reasons, uh, people are divorcing, or you know, anything can be happen be happening behind the scenes. This is why it's very important to move quickly when you're purchasing a home because you don't want to give your buyer any reason to, you know, be uncertain and ah, oh, you know, forget this. No, do everything quickly so they can see you're serious and it doesn't give them any kind of space 
to if they're on the fence about something to go the other side which doesn't work out in your favor so essentially as a buyer everything is working towards the date when you exchange contracts so contracts tend to be exchanged once everything has been finalized um you know mortgages have been agreed surveys have been sorted out um negotiations have been done all paperwork have come through to uh, your solicitors the solicitors are happy that you know all the legalities are above board and everything is fine this is when you start to see an exchange of contract or contract exchange date looming but now as a buyer when this date looms nearer and you have an idea okay it might be at this specific time of the month or whatever this is the date then you are in a position to kind of negotiate when is best i think even on the seller's part there will be because i negotiated so your solicitor will negotiate on your behalf and your estate agent when the best moving date is now once contracts are exchanged this means the house is officially yours congratulations <laughs> and you can expect to be provided with the keys everything is very official once this date comes you will get a call in the morning from the solicitors all that money will be transferred i will never forget that day when i saw so many thousands in my bank account this is the time when everything is real so um the money will be paid over and um keys have to be exchanged on that date and that means the seller has come out to your yard because <laughs> i fear yard no so yeah keys have to be left um and yeah it's, it's a very official process so, and also during this process just at this last stage as well the house has to be in the condition that the yourself as a buyer that it was presented to you during the viewing so they can't now if things have subsequently happened they are responsible for fixing those things if anything happens between that time because they were the owners of the house and just a side note before this stage as well before contracts are exchanged yourself as a buyer i did say not to go out and purchase anything but once i'm going through this process for at least two months this is a sign to say okay i'm gonna get this house everything looks like it's gonna be above it's going to be above board so I can I can go out and start buying a um, few bits and pieces at the stages um, in buying the home you can request to your uh, seller I want to come and measure up I want to come and measure up for my curtains measure up for my sofa all those things you can do your measurements obviously you can also request for additional viewings so if you do feel like oh, I need to check something out in the house you can contact your estate agent and say to the buyer hey I'd, I'd love to come and have a look at some things and I would suggest as well just before contracts are exchanged that uh, that you go ahead and you find out how things work if you're um, if you're moving in by yourself or if you're not confident with electrics and um, boilers and all those things you can be you can request to be shown you can request to be shown um, how these things work for when you do move in okay and I believe that's it hopefully I've covered everything in terms of the basics that you need to know when you're preparing to buy your first property now in terms of timeline because like I said it's very difficult to just streamline everything and say this takes that many weeks and then you do one two three four because so much about property kind of goes in a circle nothing is ever linear and sometimes you have to go back to things so so if things work smoothly and this also depends on if you have a mortgage in principle this really speeds things up but if you have everything in place, then I would recommend that you be prepared to get your new home. After you put your bid in and it has been accepted, you're looking at perhaps about three months, around about that mark. What can tend to slow things down is when you're tardy in terms of sending your paperwork in or um, tardiness in general, whether it's on your part or whether it's on the part of other third parties like solicitors not responding in time. If you have to deal with the council, listen, your buy is, your purchase is going to be long. It's, it's gonna take a while. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to have got this video out there, especially for um, potentially younger, uh, younger viewers who are buying their first property. I purchased my first property when I was 25. Don't be daunted by the process. Is that a word? <laughs> Don't be daunted by the process. It's doable. When I purchased my first house, I had no idea what I was doing. Everything just falls into place. But it's it's not scary. Once you have your people in place, your solicitors and all the other third party uh, agencies, they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. This is gonna be one of the biggest decisions, the biggest purchases you've made of your life. Um, invest wisely but it's a really good 
pay off it's a re property is an extremely good investment and I would advocate for anybody at some point in their life to do that so thank you so much for watching and yeah I appreciate your viewership um, don't forget to like comment share and I will see you soon on the next video take care bye